legacy that outlives us. I won my legacy with duty and honor. Brought order to my home. And justice for my people. You are nothing like me. Neither is your nephew. But his name is bound to your legacy. A legacy is more than a name. Ah, true. If Ghost of Tsushima has taught us anything about storytelling, it's this one element. Perspective is everything. Perspective is the exploration of a paradox, how not just a character, but an audience themselves can be both blind and perceptive at the same time, depending on their point of view. And it can be used to create the perfect storm for a tragedy. It takes concise, impactful dialogue with logical, well-structured events dependent on each other that fit together for the finished product. But ultimately, it's about what you were told and what you aren't. What you are shown and what is kept hidden from you. And no character illustrates the insane potential of perspective-driven story than Lord Shimura, Chito of Tsushima. When I saw the story of Ghost of Tsushima for the first time, and I wasn't even playing the game but just a spectator, I wasn't sure what to think of the character of Lord Shimura. Obviously, he was set up to be a generally good person, and while he had some narrow views on being a warrior, it seemed he would mostly be a plot device to get Jin on his journey, and probably proved to be generic and disposable somewhere along the way. The story was about Jin after all. Instead. The developers from Sucker Punch completely subverted my expectations and created one of the most complex and well-developed mentor figures I've ever seen in a literary or fictional narrative, and who I've become convinced is actually the most important character in the game. I found myself more than just invested with this character. I essentially turned into Jin, and when I found myself wanting to be invested in by Lord Shimura, that's no easy feat for a storyteller. It's one thing to love a character, it's a whole other thing to want to be loved by a character that's not even real. And it's yet another thing to feel genuine guilt when you actually wanted to harm them at some point before realizing your mistake. To understand Lord Shimura and give him a proper character analysis befitting his role, I'm going to outline the story of Ghost of Tsushima, not from Jin's perspective, but as seen through the eyes of Shimura himself, if he had been the central character the whole time. And to do that, we need to start with his context, where he came from, and what makes him who he is when the events of Ghost of Tsushima finally play out. This is the tale of Lord Shimura. We must begin our tale with the origins of Clan Shimura. A long time ago, in generations past, Clan Shimura was small and didn't even have land of their own. However, when their lord Kugewara called for their aid, they loyally helped to defeat some notorious bandits that ruled the island. When lord Kugewara's sons all died in the conflict, he arranged his daughter to marry the heir of Clan Shimura and so all his holdings passed on to them. The rise of Clan Shimura mirrors the rise of Clan Sakai generations later, which became the favored clan when they helped defeat Clan Yarikawa years before the events of our main story. It's possible that when Clan Shimura became the paramount lords of Tsushima, that they earned themselves a new clan emblem, but either way, it's quite significant to what the present-day Lord Shimura represents for the whole island. His emblem is that of a rising sun over the land, and his secondary symbols are agrarian, that of the ox and the wheat field, a figurehead to a wealthy, prosperous land, putting the people's needs first and always look to for hope, life, and light. A very heavy responsibility, and yet one accepted with humility. Perhaps in wearing the bold-headed horns of an ox, 
the clan armor of Shimura represents not only strength, but servitude to the people themselves. Not much is known about Shimura's early life except that his clan was well established in his youth. He had parents, siblings, a wife, and sons. Perhaps he wasn't even the firstborn in his family and was adjusted to relative insignificance. However, his wife and sons all died at young ages for unknown causes, possibly sickness or even childbirth. It's a part of his life now locked away in his memory, but it is central to his deep-rooted feelings of loneliness and isolation. Some years later, we've reached the events of the Yarikawa Rebellion, 20 years before the Mongol invasion of Tsushima. Clan Yarikawa became jealous of the power of Clan Shimura and sought to grasp it, as is a common threat to stability of that time period. They were warriors arguably better than Clan Shimura, but they resorted to bloodthirsty tactics that hardened them and ultimately was their downfall. In the horrible war, Lord Shimura's father and brothers were all struck down by Lord Yarikawa, but he survived to avenge their deaths. However, this couldn't have happened without the loyalty and ingenuity of the Lord Kazumasa Sakai, brother-in-law to Lord Shimura, and together they put down the rebellion. The land of Yarikawa was forever scarred by the conflict, and a permanent rift formed between Clan Shimura and the people of Yarikawa, one that could not be mended by Lord Shimura himself, who had suffered too much at their hands. And now an enormous responsibility was placed on his shoulders. Only in his thirties, he became the new Jito of Tsushima, more isolated and hated than ever before. While he had no heir, Lord Shimura managed to help raise Jin Sakai, the son of Kazumasa Sakai. Throughout Jin's childhood, Shimura was able to fill a hole in his upbringing that was left empty. Lord Sakai was also a widower for almost as long as Shimura, but he was in a depression for many years ever since his wife, Lord Shimura's sister, had passed away. Shimura taught his nephew the basics of sword fighting and riding a horse even in young age, seeing a lot of promise in him to become a strong warrior just like his father. Lord Sakai's mixture of harshness and neglect brought Jin and Lord Shimura perhaps closer than would have normally occurred between a mentor and a child. Perhaps even then, Shimura developed a yearning for something he couldn't quite pin down. The true turning point for these two clans came the day bandits attacked the Sakai estate and slayed Lord Kazumasa Sakai. Jin was only a youth, but now he was orphaned, left completely to fend for himself. At the funeral, it became obvious to Lord Shimura that destiny lay right in front of him, that it was both his duty and his dream to take care of Jin as his ward, if not something more. Both of them were very much alone, and he could see himself in this helpless young boy. A repetition of history was about to unfold, the embracing of the lesser clan by the greater to form one common bond and a single family. If Shimura had shown affection with restraint before, he no longer restrained it now. Jin had brought joy and purpose back into his life, the child he was never able to have. While treating Jin as a Sakai, always in his heart, he longed to make him his own son, a direct heir to his spiritual legacy. He poured years of training, wisdom, and love into this young man, making him grow courageous, self-controlled, but also compassionate. Jin would become the greatest warrior clan Sakai had ever known. However, while Jin grew equally fond of his uncle, he feared that it was too good to last. At some point early on, under his uncle's protection, Jin ran away from home. When he was found, much to Lord Shimura's dismay, Jin admits that he's afraid that he will be abandoned as soon as his uncle has a son of his own, a true heir. Jin was grateful for the love that his uncle gave him, but he lacked assurance that he was more than just a plan B to be easily discarded later. And so, Lord Shimura gives Jin the most powerful promise he would ever hear, that he would never leave Jin's side, no matter what. There was no plan B. Even if it was left unspoken, they both embraced the fact that they had become father and son.
flash forward to the present day. Lord Shimura is now a venerable lord in his fifties, and Jin is now a young man around thirty. You would be hard pressed to find a pair of samurai so in tune with each other. When they confront the Mongol hordes on the beaches of Komoda, they have one mind, and that is to fight with honor for their home. Shimura saves Jin's life on the battlefield, and being the best warriors, they rush to the end, hoping to at least die together. Perhaps it would have been better if they had died on that beach and never experienced the tragedy that would befall them. Instead, uncle and nephew are separated, and Lord Shimura is captured, believing himself to be the last samurai alive. The Mongol leader, Kotun Khan, has plans to use him for his own agenda to turn him into an ally. But to the Khan's chagrin, Chimura is much too stubborn and upright of a man to surrender to such dishonorable scum as him. For at least at this point in his tale, he deems himself to be free while he still has choice over his actions. If only that were ever the case. In the days to come, Shimura has prepared himself for death when he gets unexpected news from the Khan that Jin is still alive. Hope reignites, and it's enough to get him through the grueling days of isolation, psychological torture, and starvation. His nephew will come through, he knows it. But then he starts hearing things from the Khan. Men stabbed in the back, torn apart in vicious ways. And this is being done by none other than Jin. But how can it be? How can his gentle, honorable nephew suddenly resort to such monstrous actions? What has happened to Jin that he has turned so dark? Shimura can only brood in silence and not betray his feelings. But one thing he does say to the Khan, he and Jin are nothing like him, and they will do what it takes to stop him. When Jin finally arrives to save his uncle in the eleventh hour, it's the first time it feels like they have a fighting chance. Shimura discovers that they have allies after all, even if from unexpected places, and if they can all work together, they can build an army to put an end to the Khan's ravaging of their land. He also discovers that Jin started approaching the conflict differently while they were apart, and reminds him that a samurai mustn't resort to cowardly or cruel behavior, no matter the temptation. Even now, he cannot chide Jin so harshly, because he knows he's indebted to him. But it's one of the many internal conflicts Shimura goes through in this story. In Act 2, Lord Shimura makes it all the more obvious that he is enamored with Jin. He praises him left and right, never ceasing to show how proud he is of his nephew. When they successfully get an envoy out to sea to contact the shogun, he makes his plans open to Jin that he wishes to adopt him. This whole ordeal proved to Shimura that Jin was a man after his own heart, a noble-hearted warrior who fought for the people with courage. All those years of work and training finally paid off, his finest creation complete. They only needed to make it official, and it was finally time to do so. Such lofty aspirations ahead of both of them. But little does Shimura know the change happening in Jin's heart. While he awaits the Shogun's reinforcements and does his own campaigns, he does not witness Jin's defense and recruitment of the Arikawa people, or Jin's conversations with Yuriko. He of course hears of the name that Jin has acquired, the Ghost, but he deems it merely a tool to get the people to follow Jin. However, when the Shogun's men arrive with Lord Oga, now they have eyes watching both of them. The night before the final battle to take back Castle Shimura, uncle and nephew confide in each other one last time. Shimura discovers that Jin was actually captured by the Khan and that his friend Taka died. But again, Jin holds back the true nature of the events that transpired, especially with the betrayal of his best friend Ryuso. For the last time, Shimura entreats Jin to hold true to his samurai roots and remember to follow the code at this moment of crisis. Never for the whole story has Shimura once shunned or reprimanded Jin harshly for what he has done, choosing to be gentle in order to get Jin to change. He's been nothing but conciliatory to Jin this whole time, but now that the whole world is watching them, 
They have to be the role models they've trained for their whole lives. The stability of the island depends on it. Jin promises him he won't disappoint him. And to hear that is enough for Shimura. He knows it will be so. On the day of battle, Shimura takes charge with his honorable warfare. And while there are lives lost, they are successful at pushing the Mongols back. But in the fray of battle, Jin terrorizes a battalion of Mongols with dishonorable tactics right in front of Shimura and the shogun's forces. It's so out of character that Shimura freezes the whole onslaught to demand an explanation. It's inconceivable that Jin would possibly do something like this, here, right now. The campaign continues, with Shimura trying to get Jin to do what he does best, just not with impulsive, brutal behavior. But when a final attack is made on the bridge towards Castle Shimura, he ignores his nephew's warning and goes straight ahead, seeing no reason to change his strategy now when they were so close. Instead, they run straight into a trap, and many men are killed on that bridge. Even Lord Shimura knows it was a mistake, though he would not openly admit it, not when the thief from Yarikawa lurks at Jin's side all the time. This irritating, complaining peasant has started getting under his skin. When they are alone, Lord Shimura and Jin spar with words to prove their point that the other is wrong. Jin is merely acting on impulse, while Shimura is acting on pride. Jin proposes the unthinkable, to wield poison, a weapon of mass destruction and chaos, to eliminate all the Mongols in one fell swoop. It's terrifying to hear his nephew lash out with such rage, but what bothers him more than anything yet is when Jin says that he is the one who sacrificed everything while well, Shimura did absolutely nothing. In a few words, he throws his uncle away and everything they ever did together, essentially saying he's a failure. It's Shimura's moment to snap, and he strikes Jin as if he were a child. Immediately realizing his mistake, he seeks to apologize, but it is too late. He lost his nephew's trust. That night, Lord Shimura broods alone, speaking to no one and hearing no advice. But his treatment of Jin lingers heavy on his conscience. Why was everything coming apart? They seemed to be one mind just the day before, but now everything changed. Jin despised him, but he also despised what Jin was doing. How could they work together now? Neither reach out to each other that night to reconcile, to find compromise. That's why, in the middle of the night when Jin is discovered to have disappeared, Shimura knows exactly what has happened and mobilizes his troops. It's come to this. For the first time, Jin has let him down in the worst way imaginable, worse than either of them could even know. A combination of righteous rage, hurt pride, and fear rules Shimura's heart in this moment. All the ramifications of this act of terror come to mind, which he knows he provoked Jin to do. But he can't be all to blame. How could Jin be so foolish? There's only one thing he can do, and even now he will not hesitate. Blame Yuna the thief, and get rid of her destructive influence on Jin's mind. Forget the motivations that drove Jin to this point. Forget all the people who gave their lives for their sake. Forget the fact that dishonor was the very reason both of them were still alive. Save his heir, save his legacy, no matter the cost. Make Jin choose him. Surely Jin will come to see reason. It's not with humble supplication that he asks Jin to be his son. He demands it with all the righteous entitlement he knows he deserves. The ultimate act of samurai hubris. And Lord Shimura is denied. Two trains have collided in a magnificent wreck, mutually assured destruction. He drops the adoption paper into the flames. Dreams utterly shattered. What have we done? Some time passes, and Lord Shimura gets word from the Shogun that Jin must be sent for judgment. This certainly means the disbanding of Clan Sakai, and possibly his death. But the
The Shogun's representatives are here. He cannot say no. He's already heard the doubts among the warriors. Shimura is building up dishonor on himself, and his removal as Jito of Tsushima is assured if he continues to fail in battle. First, he failed at Komoda, and his failures at the Battle of Castle Shimura led to his unruly nephew staining the samurai reputation. This all is surely Shimura's fault, for a good soldier would never openly defy a Jito in such a massive way, not unless he were both weak and a coward himself. The fear grows. An emissary rushes in to tell him that Jin escaped and headed north into the wastelands. Shimura can no longer contain his grief at such an appalling betrayal. Now is the beginning of the dark night of the soul. In the days to come, Shimura splits Jin into two halves in his mind in order to cope with his grief and anger. The ghost is not Jin Sakai, and he will be never mentioned as such. The ghost is an outlaw, a war criminal, worthy of punishment, and must be shunned. He is a threat to all of Tsushima. The ghost poison was acquired by the Mongols and put to good use against the innocence of Tsushima. Not only the Mongols, but bandits and common folk use it against each other for their own selfish purposes, spreading fear and suffering. While Shimura himself couldn't have predicted this, he knew this was exactly the risk he warned Jin about. He was right all along, and now the ghost has to undo what he started or the mainland of Japan was doomed to an even worse fate. And yet, all the while, Shimura remembers Jin, his true son. This is the part he cannot let go of. He would want to forgive his son, but how can he when Jin no longer wants to be his son? All those years of support, of compassion and love, thrown away, but Shimura knows that it is not merely Jin's fault. He failed Jin somewhere along the way, but he knows not where, and this keeps him up night after night. He learns of the ghost's exploits in the north, defeating the Mongols successfully, while his own scouts go missing with no information. And Shimura is faced with the truth. He needs Jin. He cannot do this without him. Perhaps this is what has unconsciously stayed his hand from actively hunting him down. The paradox of needing that which you hate, to come to accept its necessary use, is abhorrent to him, but he knows it to be true. When a mysterious note arrives in his quarters, he learns Jin's side of the situation. He too is in desperate need, and requests help to stop the Khan at Port Izumi before it's too late. Perhaps Jean has some remorse after all, but remains firm that they are simply warriors of different paths. While Shimura can't bring himself to agree on this part, he recognizes his son's voice and not the ghost, the desire to rescue his son. But at what cost? After long deliberation, Lord Shimura decides to take the risk. He rallies his men to march north towards Port Izumi, and while he fights apart from the ghost, he chooses to aid him rather than hinder him. The ghost is successful at slaying the Khan, while Shimura's army overtakes the port. Two warriors, two codes, working together for the last time. Close, yet distant. In reporting the news of the Khan's death at the hands of the ghost, and Shimura's direct assistance therein, the Shogun gives an ultimatum. Lord Shimura has proven his skill and shall remain Jito of Tsushima, training the mainland's warriors to fight the Mongols in the event of another attack. However, the existence of the ghost and his army, which hasn't demobilized since the victory of Port Izumi, they are a direct threat to the order of the samurai and the Shogun. Furthermore, he questions Shimura's trustworthiness if he can do what needs to be done. The final verdict. Clan Sakai has been disbanded. New samurai are to replace those who were lost. And Jin Sakai is branded a traitor. For Shimura's failure to control his nephew, his punishment is to kill Jin Sakai 
and prove his loyalty to the Shogun. For the first time in his life, Shimura realizes what he truly is. Keeping this order to himself, he secretly sends a message to Jin, asking to meet him where they once spent much time together, Omi Lake. Shimura prays to the gods that Jin will not come, and waits in pale silence a ways off. But when Jin arrives so eagerly, he knows it is time. He must face their fate. Even when he faces Jin, he can only bring himself to reveal the truth slowly. Jin's disappointment that he is no longer a samurai is not unexpected, but he still shows little remorse for what he's done. He suggests Shimura remarry now that he can no longer be his heir. How empty those words sound to him now. Shimura takes Jin through a thought process. The island is forever changed. The people have banded together without the order of the samurai. They think for themselves, but they also have little loyalty for anyone other than the ghost. They don't follow Jin. They follow an image of terror and dishonor. So why would they respect the samurai anymore? How does Jin not realize what he has done? How could he still be so blind to what he has caused? Anger grows in Jimura. But he falls silent on the way to the Sakai Cemetery. Dread. Jin's innocence in this moment, the sad acceptance, and yet always the same hopeful ignorance that things will get better, that things will be all right even though he won't be his heir, that they will part ways amicably, and that shall be the end of it. Jimura can hardly bear it. They come to the grave of Jin's parents. Shimura prays, Forgive me, Kazumasa, for what I am about to do. Forgive me, sister, for what I must do. Lord Shimura pronounces the words of death, and Jin is horrified. He was lured here to be executed all this time. Shimura explains that it was always inevitable, but Jin's harsh tone is clear. You probably wanted me dead this whole time. That's how selfish you are. You threw me away just like your own people. You probably will enjoy this moment of righteous retribution on me, the one who failed you. I always was just a means to an end. You are a slave to honor, and this has made you nothing but a monster. A slave. You are right, Jin. And that's why I have no choice. Jin's pride is broken down as he realizes what has really happened. He completely misunderstood what his uncle really felt for him this whole time. But now it was too late. Never has Lord Shimura hated himself more than in this moment. Jin ruined everything, but only because he failed Jin. His lifelong quest to preserve the legacy of his forefathers, to achieve inner purity and never succumb to the darkness, to never become what he hated, it had all come to nothing. He had dared to dream, but he had staked his whole life on it, and now he had lost everything. Failure always has been, and always would be, the legacy of Lord Chimura and a failure like him deserves to die. There is no such thing as life without Jin. In the duel, Shimura's self-hatred becomes so consuming that he loses all control of his emotions, and Jin puts an end to this unthinkable act, striking him down. Shimura has been deemed unworthy of his title, his clan, his life, there is only one choice left for him, and that's to accept death. If Jin honors his wish for death, he dies with the assurance that at least Jin forgave him and was willing to preserve what legacy he had left to his name and was willing to call him his father after all. But if he is spared, Shimura is given so much more than that. Jin, in an act of mercy, frees his father 
from the chains of false honor. The honor code of the samurai had betrayed both of them, and it will not have the last word on their lives. The weak, the broken, the failed, they all need mercy, not sacrifice, to redeem them. Jin was always more than a ghost, but Shimura was always more than a samurai. They were family, and Shimura needed to see this now in the moment of crisis. As shocking as this mercy is, Shimura accepts his choice and lets Jin go. What happens next, we do not know for sure. Shimura survives to live another day. Does he learn a lesson? Is he a changed man? That is left to the imagination, but I like to think he did. While he is forever spiritually wounded, he may have learned what's most important, that his identity is more than just a samurai, but a genuinely good person who can keep fighting for the greater good just as much as Jin. How can I possibly put into words how much this character means to me? The best way to describe Lord Shimura narratively is as a static character, one that remains internally the same for the majority of the story and only reacts to external events. This is why he ultimately serves better as a supporting role rather than a central protagonist. He never betrays his character, and it's even to a fault. But when all said and done, Far be it for me to say that he deserves anything that happens to him. I went through such an interesting journey with him, one that I hope others have as well. Lord Chimura was someone that I progressively warmed up to, not an immediate interest. His paradoxical nature was shown from the very beginning. Stoic, yet highly sensitive. Harsh in appearance, and yet inwardly golden-hearted. Stubborn, yet extraordinarily courageous and self-sacrificial. He knows how to use people for his own ends, and yet abhors the idea of making the innocent fear him as a tyrant. He walks the fine line of power used for the good of others versus himself, and perhaps he becomes too comfortable with that power. But while the samurai code dominates his whole identity, Never once does he use the code to shame or control Jin, but chooses positive reinforcement and compassion to instill the values he reveres so much. The ultimate goal of inner purity, resisting hatred and fear. He's a beautiful depiction of a father figure, having all the best traits of a good mentor. His most important trait is his unconditional love. Even when Jin disowns him as his father, Shimura never disowns Jin. He only rejects the ghost, which he sees as something that has possessed his son and not his ultimate identity, which is ultimately true. Jin likewise makes the decision to bestow Shimura an identity outside of being a samurai. However, this is what makes Shimura's mistakes that much more painful, to see his character flaws as the story unfolds. The flaws of rigidness, condescension, possessiveness, and worst of all, pride. As Yuriko told Jin, the proud do not endure. The greatest of us fall in the end. When Shimura's failures increase, so does our desire to see him be set free from his bondage to pride and false honor. That's why I would call Shimura the true tragic figure of the story, because while Jin loses his past identity, Shimura loses his future and everything that mattered to him, and his spirit is truly crushed for it. Before we eat, I have one last question. For generations, our families have lived by a code. Tell me the virtues that guide us. Loyalty to our lord, control over our emotions, and... You know this. Honor, to fight bravely and uphold the legacy of Clan Sakai. Those are your father's words. What does honor mean to you? I guess... protecting people. The ones who can't fight for themselves. 
You have a good heart. But first, we must show everyone that we serve our Lord with courage, integrity, and self-control. You say that like it's easy. It's never easy, Jin. I struggle with it every day. But we must set an example for our people by remaining true to our code and to ourselves. That is the meaning of honor. If there was a single mistake that Chimura made along the way with Jin, it was that he taught Jin too well, without recognizing that Jin had become different and even better than himself. Jin learned to be true to himself because of his uncle, but his uncle never showed him the truth of how hypocritical and enslaving the samurai code really was. Jin's hopeful idealism and love for his people transcended the systemic and false honor of the samurai, leaving his uncle behind to continue in enslavement. This is where things get interesting between them. Shimura's actual legacy, not the one he thinks himself to have earned at the end of the story. Not failure. But it was not Jin either. Jin is his son, but he is not his heir. Shimura's legacy was his own integrity that always transcended the samurai code in the first place, demonstrated by his purity of heart and his steadfast love for Jin. His legacy wasn't Jin. It was who he was for Jin. And to destroy this person, this contrasting perspective, is irreparable damage to the balance of life itself. Jin and Shimura together form balance, a yin-yang. They are not the same person. They are very different, and they must be different in order to be true to themselves. But each are weakened without the other and it's through them not seeing the strength in each other that they fall apart. But if both lives could be redeemed, even if they could no longer be together, balance within life is struck, and true harmony is acquired that is beneficial to all people. Each carry a part of the other. To destroy one half or the other is to destroy both parts in the end. We have to recognize and embrace the strength in each other, or we will all fall to pride in the end. And that is the ultimate message of this story. Do you understand now what I mean by Lord Shimura being the most important character of the game? Sure, Jin would have come to the same conclusions about true honor. But he would not have the character progression of fully understanding how to find strength in all perspectives. The way of the samurai would have become completely vilified in this story if not for Shimura. The baby would have been thrown out with the bathwater. This game isn't about glorifying the samurai per se, but it does give them a fair shake for what they're worth, and that there are good people among them. It's just that now that we have Jin, who can finally balance these forces of influence inside himself. When he recognizes the strength of the ghost and the strength of Shimura, and he gets to live on to tell his cautionary tale, to make everyone stronger for him, he will not make the mistakes of the samurai or the ghost to take pride in only either of those. He will simply be Jin Sakai, a protector of the people what everyone was striving to be in the first place. That is how he will be remembered, at least by those who know the truth. Even though he's an outlaw on the run, and must live with the consequences of his actions, both good and bad, Jin finds inner peace. We can only hope that Lord Shimura finds peace as well. <laughs>